Chapter 11 Next day the field marshal gave a dinner and ball which the emperor honored by his presence. Kutuzov had received the order of St. George of the first class and the emperor showed him the highest honors, but everyone knew of the imperial dissatisfaction with him. The proprieties were observed and the emperor was the first to set that example, but everybody understood that the old man was blameworthy and good for nothing. When Kutuzov, conforming to a custom of Catherine's day, ordered the standards that had been captured to be lowered at the emperor's feet on his entering the ballroom, the emperor made a wry face and muttered something in which some people caught the words, the old comedian. The emperor's displeasure with Kutuzov was specially increased at Vilna by the fact that Kutuzov evidently could not or would not understand the importance of the coming campaign. When on the following morning the emperor said to the officers assembled about him, you have not only saved Russia, you have saved Europe, they all understood that the war was not ended. Kutuzov alone would not see this and openly expressed his opinion that no fresh war could improve the position or add to the glory of Russia, but could only spoil and lower the glorious position that Russia had gained. He tried to prove to the emperor the impossibility of levying fresh troops, spoke of the hardships already endured by the people, of the possibility of failure and so forth. This being the field marshal's frame of mind he was naturally regarded as merely a hindrance and obstacle to the impending war. To avoid unpleasant encounters with the old man, the natural method was to do what had been done with him at Austerlitz and with Barclay at the beginning of the Russian campaign, to transfer the authority to the emperor himself, thus cutting the ground from under the commander-in-chief's feet without upsetting the old man by informing him of the change. With this object his staff was gradually reconstructed and its real strength removed and transferred to the emperor. Tol, Konovnitsyn, and Ermolov received fresh appointments. Everyone spoke loudly of the field marshal's great weakness and failing health. His health had to be bad for his place to be taken away and given to another. And in fact his health was poor. So naturally, simply, and gradually, just as he had come from Turkey to the treasury in Petersburg to recruit the militia, and then to the army when he was needed there, now when his part was played out, Kutuzov's place was taken by a new and necessary performer. The War 1812, besides its national significance dear to every Russian heart, was now to assume another, a European, significance. The movement of peoples from west to east was to be succeeded by a movement of peoples from east to west, and for this fresh war another leader was necessary, having qualities and views differing from Kutuzov's and animated by different motives. Alexander I was as necessary for the movement of the peoples from east to west and for the refixing of national frontiers as Kutuzov had been for the salvation and glory of Russia. Kutuzov did not understand what Europe, the balance of power, or Napoleon meant. He could not understand it. For the representative of the Russian people, after the enemy had been destroyed and Russia had been liberated and raised to the summit of her glory, there was nothing left to do as a Russian. Nothing remained for the representative of the national war but to die, and Kutuzov died. 